this. <laughs> this is Mike, one of our friendly AV team members. He's going to be helping us throughout the day. We also have Mike in back on the AV team. Thank you. <laughs> They're going to make sure things keep moving smoothly for us. So I want to thank you all for being here today. And I am actually pausing because I'm like, you know what? I don't see my speaker notes in here. Let's try it one more time. Okay, one moment. I need my cheat sheet. <laughs> so I'm going to do it this way because of this amazing podium. I can see, can see? through it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. So as we get started, I want to make sure to, uh, to uh, quickly thank Fjord for providing our breakfast that we had this morning. So I want to thank Fjord. Thank you. And um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes. And I know that you're not really here to hear me talk. And I'm not really you know, the exciting part of the presentation. So I'm going to start by saying, if you did not put your business card in the raffle box, just get up and leave me here and go put it in. <laughs> or do it soon, because we are planning to pull names out of the raffle stuff like while the sessions are going. And then we're going to post winners, and I'll mention winners later on. And there's some awesome things that are going, we're raffling off. So if you didn't, you might sneak out and put your, put your card in. Um, OK, so with that out of the way, I am really excited to be here today. This has been a long time in coming. I was at the IA Summit back, uh, I guess it was April, maybe March, April or so of last year, and decided I, I wanted this to happen again in Los Angeles. Um, and so it, it's great to be here practically a year later uh, enjoying this. Um, and you know, as, as, as you probably know, this is part of a, a global thing. It's called World IA Day for a reason, because this is happening in many, uh, many places around the globe, actually, on February 20. So like last night, while I was trying to wrap up my preparations, uh, you know, there were the folks in the Eastern Hemisphere were starting World IA Day, and we're tweeting about it. So it's like all over Twitter for you know, all night long. Um, and I'm going to spend just a couple minutes telling you a little more uh, about this event. And you know, I got some slides from the global team. There's a global team that makes sure this thing happens. And there's some things they wanted me to share. So I'm going to be, be sharing that. Um, first, just a little rundown again on World Information Architecture Day. So it's this one day annual celebration. It's hosted by the Information Architecture Institute. And yay! <laughs> As I mentioned, it's held simultaneously in places around the globe. And every year, there's a theme. This year's theme is information everywhere, architects everywhere. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, and then folks can put in an open call for locations. So like we, we responded to the call for cities back in May of last year. And you know, if, if you're not from here and you want to have it in your hometown, put in for the call for cities next year. Or if you want to be the person for LA, let's talk. <laughs> Because um, you know it'll be coming up again soon. Um, also, let's talk a little bit about what information architecture is. So uh, I kind of doctored up the slide that they gave me. Um, um, they, the the global team gave me the first bullet. Um, you know, which there's which is a nice uh, it's a nice way of putting it. I especially like this notion of understanding and order. To me, those are really important parts about information architecture. Um, and actually, the second bullet I grabbed off of the IA Institute website, I, I some, in some ways feel it's maybe a stronger uh, a definition of this, deciding how to arrange the parts of something to be understandable. And that's what this guy is doing. So you know, those of you who are of my generation or so will remember Busy Town. Um, this is Business Town. Um, there was a, a, like a Tumblr blog that somebody put together with Business Town. And um, you, it's probably not uh, legible right now, but I, I really like this diagram in a lot of ways, partly because I, although I, I used to wear vests more, I don't wear them much now. <laughs> I do own many pairs of Keen shoes. I am not wearing Keens right now, but I made sure to use the Keen shoe box for the raffle drop-in. They're really awesome shoes for information architects to wear. Um, I should get Keen as a sponsor. Yeah. So, um, but this just says the information architect 
architect structure digital, con digital content environments. And that's also a pretty nice way of putting it. So I think that's a good one to have there. Um, we mentioned the, the Information Architecture Institute. Um, this is a global nonprofit volunteer organization, and um, you, you may have seen, and if you didn't stop by later, there's a table back here. We got a couple representatives of the IA Institute here. Um, and the IA Institute has provided a ton of support for this event happening around the globe. There's other events, and so um, they're, they're always looking for more uh, members and partners and supporters. So I, I encourage you to, to talk to folks who are here today. Um, and now I am going to switch over and play a little video. This is a global, so everybody, every location around the globe is going to be looking at this video. Am I good? or bus to take, whether we're watching the local news at home or working in the studio on the latest app. Information is pervasive and affects everyone's life. I'm going to restart Nowadays, that, we see information being... It's very short, so I'm just going to restart it. Our world is filled with information, whether it's figuring out what bank to use or bus to take whether we're watching the local news at home or working in the studio on the latest app. Information is pervasive and affects everyone's life. Nowadays, we see information being architected by people holding all sorts of titles, coming from all walks of life. Information truly is everywhere, and there are architects everywhere. Thanks for joining World IA Day this year. We look forward to hearing your stories. You may have recognized Abby Covert's voice doing the voiceover for that video. She's the president of the IA Institute. She uh, has a book out, um, How to Make Sense of Any Mess, which is a very interesting book. We're actually going to be giving, there's a, it's one of the raffle prizes today also. Um, so these are the board of directors from the IA Institute. You may recognize somebody up there. There she is, Laura, yay! <laughs> So Laura has been, uh, um, it's, it's great for us, it's a real asset for us in Los Angeles to have Laura, I mean, to have her representing us at the IA Institute. Um, the last time that we had a World IA Day event in Los Angeles, Laura brought it to us right here in 2014. Um, and um, she was really helpful to me and supportive of us making this happen again in, in 2016. So thank you, Laura. <laughs> Um, these are the members of the global event leadership team. So these folks have been working tirelessly for, I don't know, the, a past year or more to make this year's event happen around the globe. And you know, they provided a sort of event templates for us of any stripe you could imagine, like how to basically how to run an event. So they, they made sure that any of the locations would be able to get up and running. Um, and this is the fifth year that we've had World Information Architecture Day. You can see that it really is quite an impressive list of locations uh, that, uh, where it's happening this year. Um, just looking back briefly, uh, it's grown from back in 2012. There were 14 cities. And um, this year we're actually at, I believe it's 57 locations that, that are holding events. So it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, and I, I noticed, I think it was this morning, I noticed that our hashtag was actually noted as a trend, trending uh, tag. You know, there's so many events and people are, are tweeting like crazy, on, so it's, it's actually getting up there with, I don't know, the um, other sorts of social media uh, faves. Um, we have, uh, these are just some of the stats regarding the Information Architecture Institute. Um, so you can see, um, the, about the, the scope of that group. It was established in 2002 
Um, and I, w I need to briefly share our, our code of conduct for the event, and this is something that the, the global event team was, is really committed to make sure that we have events that are, you know, are comfortable and safe places for everybody, the speakers, presenters, attendees, uh, sponsors, everybody who's here. So if the, anybody has any concerns or uh, doesn't feel that, you know, doesn't feel comfortable, you know, come speak to me or one of the other kind of volunteer with the, with the red badge on, um, or you can go straight to the, the World Die A Day um, group, you know, and, and get some support. Um, I want to take a minute to thank sponsors of many types and places. We have global sponsors who are providing support to the global team, who is then kind of pushing that out to all of us in these locations. Um, uh, for instance, many of these folks have been providing, um, in addition to monetary support for things like streaming support at the global level, uh, many of our interesting uh, raffle prizes are coming from, from global sponsors. And we, of course, have an impressive list of local sponsors. I, I feel uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with the folks who, who stepped up to support our event, support our community. So I'm going to take a, a, a couple minutes and, and uh, share some comments about that. So obviously, we have Art Center. They're, they're our venue partner. And it's really great to have this partnership happen again. And uh, you know, I want to thank uh, JoJo, who's in back, who's been a, a great partner for us, and also Maggie for, for helping out. We'll be seeing Maggie in a minute up, front, up here. Thank you. And you know what? I'm going to have. A, I'm going to say a lot of things, and maybe we can hold our applause. We don't have to. If you need to interrupt me to applaud, it's okay. But um, um, I'm going to. I want to just. I want to call out several of the sponsors. We have ADP is uh, one of our platinum sponsors and pr has provided uh, important support for the event and uh, in the form of you know funding things and also <clears throat> time for to make sure that this could happen um, as an ADP person. We have several ADP folks attending today, and you're going to see some up on stage a little later. Uh, we have Fandango as another platinum sponsor, and the, they, they're basically bringing us tacos today, so we appreciate that. Um, thank you. Yeah. We have uh, uh, Fjord and Proficient, our uh, gold sponsors who have provided our uh, Fjord our breakfast, and Proficient is, is putting on our, our snack this afternoon, which is, uh, we really appreciate that, and we have good uh, uh, groups from each of those to so make sure to speak to folks uh, from, from Fjord and Proficient as well. Um, you know, and, and we, have, uh, we have quite a roster of, of our silver sponsors, and they're, they're equally important because we, uh, you know, every, everything helped to put this together. And I, I, I want to call out some, there's some really interesting things to note here, I think. So we've got um, UX Radio, which is basically Lara. She was our first sponsor. Woohoo! <laughs> that was great. And, and then uh, La Casist, which is the, the LA chapter of the um, American Society for Information Science and Technology. I think that's the new name. Um, and uh, uh, Grace, who's part of our planning team, is a member of the La Casis chapter, and she helped bring that in. So those were our first two sponsors for the event, and I really appreciate that. Um, we also have uh, Philosophy. Chris Chandler is going to be up here later today, and he, he brought their support to us. And um, we, have, we have Tim from the Intersect Group. Hi, Tim. He's way at the back. Um, Tim, he came to us from Phoenix for the event. He came into town. He met with some of his clients in town, and he's here for the event. He helped with setup. I really appreciate it. Uh, and he's got an he's got a Amazon Echo they're raffling off, so it's a it's, uh, great support. Thank you, Tim. Um, and, uh, you know, we also have Saks Insights. They don't have anybody on site today, but they're from New York City, and they're, they're sponsoring us. And I don't know if they're sponsoring the World IA Day New York event. I mean, I don't know. But I think it's awesome we're getting that support. Um, and uh, Hunter might mention Saks, because he, he's worked with them at Capital Group. Um, also, Vivid Resources, um, Laura Hunter, Laura, hi, Laura. Vivid is, is Laura's company. It's a, it's a staffing agency, and um, you know, she's been around LA for many years, and she's been a, um, she has been a supporter of this community and wanted to re-engage with us, and this was a great opportunity for her to do so. So we thank, uh, thank you for being here with us, Laura. Um, and um, last but not least, we got LegalZoom and uh, AB Collective also came in and supported us, and uh, really appreciate that because it, it means we can have the event, you know, we can have a nice event for all of us today. So thank you to all the sponsors. I really appreciate that. And I'm over time. 
So I am going to do a really quick run through the list of raffles. There's an amazing list of raffle uh, of prizes we're raffling off, and it like keeps growing because more prizes keep showing up. It's amazing. There's 15 hard copies of, of the fourth edition of Information Architecture for the World Wide Web. They're not on site, so we'll have to send them to the winners. But um, I mean, the, many of these were like late breaking, so we don't have all of them on hand. But we will get you your prize. So if you haven't put your card in, put it in, and then we'll announce later winners, and you can, can get your prizes after that. So, OK. We, we are really ready to get started, and I want to stop eating into Art Center time. <laughs> But I'm just going to say, uh, say again, thank you, Art Center, for, su for supporting us, being our partner. Maggie, for supporting us and encouraging us to, to come here and be here today. And um, so Maggie is the chair of the Interaction Design Program here at Art Center. And she is going to get up and, and speak for a bit. And she has a panel of faculty members, who are, and they're going to share some presentations and, some, and have some discussion time with us all. So with that, I will, I will pass this over to Maggie. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's great to see so many information architects, interaction designers, UX experts, and community, basically, here at Art Center. Um, as you know, we, we've hosted this before. Um, Art Center began a Bachelor of Science in 2012 in interaction design, but we actually have a long history in interaction, interactive product, interface, all of the different names and titles that some of these practices have taken to the extent that actually Richard Saul Worman was one of our first um, honorary doctorates here at Art Center um, who as many of you know furthered the term information architecture. So today what I wanted to do was introduce you to some of our faculty. Um, our faculty are all working practitioners, artists and designers um, here at Art Center. So I really feel that they embody Part of what the Information Architecture Institute aspires to do, which is learn, practice, and teach information architecture. Um, so we have J.D. Buckley, who is a colleague um, of mine, but in interaction practice, and is also an instructor at Art Center, works with ADP, and has worked on many freelance startup and Fortune 500 companies in the area. We'll then hear from Todd Masilko, and he's going to talk a little bit about the work we do with students at Art Center. And I think we're going to start to see how information architecture has expanded from the kind of information sciences background that many of us first encountered when we started our own practices into the world of physical, material, the world where there is no interface in our interaction. Um, and then we're going to work with Jenny Rodenhaus, who is both a graduate of our graduate media program, which actually happens here in this building, um, and is also a faculty member. And her work um, as an artist and designer um, has been celebrated recently um, in Shenzhen with a medal at the Biennale. Um, and she's going to talk about the speculative nature of interaction and information architecture design. So with no further ado, I'm going to invite JD to come and join us. Um, we will take questions at the end. So each of our panel members or faculty members are going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes. And then we'll have 15 minutes to take questions from you, the audience, and um, answer any ideas or questions you may have. Hey, good morning. So what I'm going to do with you is pretend for a few seconds like you're all in my class. So I'm going to show you two videos, and I want you to pay attention because there's going to be questions afterwards for the audience. You ready? What if HR software worked like your favorite app so you could get your job done easier and faster? Rethinking the pay experience. Dave is on his way to the office and thinking about his last paycheck. He checks his pay. He quickly understands how his deductions have changed. He decides to set up his direct deposit. With just a few taps, he's done. 
rethinking the way employees enter their time. Laura is in early to prep the store to open. She easily clocks in and goes to her time card. She's been working a lot of overtime and is ready to take her vacation. Rethinking benefits enrollment. Ben starts his new job today. He meets the team and gets acquainted. He's on his lunch break. And takes a minute to choose his health plan. He estimates his out-of-pocket costs. finds a plan that's right for him. Okay, so that was one. You ready? Let's switch to the next one. Pay attention. What's the difference between the products you've seen in these two videos? Anybody? Well, it was a trick question because the answer actually is nothing. <laughs> From an IA standpoint, both these products require that we understand the context, the content, and the users to truly build successful and satisfying experiences. Um, most of you may be familiar with this model. It's from the well-known book, Information Architecture for the World Wide Web, which I think there's some free copies that are gonna be given out there, or that can be one at the end of this, uh, or some points during this day. This book was um, first published in 1998, it's on its third edition. It's by Peter Morville and Lou Rosenfeld who Lou was just recently at ADP giving a, a presentation. But what's really interesting about this book is that it first started to talk about how content, contacts, and users actually work together for us to build truly exciting and innovative experiences. And although technology has changed substantially since 1998, users still need to understand, we still need to understand users and deeply understand them, whether they're a steel worker in a factory in Kazakhstan, or managing temperature data, or a payroll admin in an office environment dealing with documents, paper, lots of paper, soft copy or hard copy, and other personal data the model still applies. So it can be really easy to be distracted by technology, its promise and its opportunities. Students can be distracted by the thought of technology, and for that matter, so can corporate executives. But whether you're dealing with augmented reality or payroll, Users still need to understand where to start their tasks, confirm they've reached their end destination, and how to figure out how to correct themselves if they've gone the wrong way or gotten lost. So 
although these products may look very different from each other, the model still applies. So at the end of the day, though, at the end of the day, um, sorry, just a second. The job of understanding and building truly innovative products and services, even in the brave new world of driverless cars and Internet of Things and augmented and virtual reality, still starts with this simple model. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can, can you hear me okay? So um, before, so my talk is entitled Designing for Behavior. Specifically what it's about is a couple examples of work that we have done in the context of the new interaction design program here at Art Center over the last couple of years that we think are a bit unconventional and that we also think um, have uh, plenty of relevance potentially for the, the way that we may approach uh, the IA world um, and inter interaction design methodology sort of going forward. So before I dig into that, I mean, how many of you are familiar with Art Center? Any show of hands? So I'm going to give you my, I'm, a, I'm an alum of Art Center, product design 20 years ago. My sort of 30-second uh, spiel about what Art Center is about or where it came from, I mean, we're a classic design school. We're famous for transportation design, graphic design, product design. We were founded by an ad industry firm owner who thought his artists maybe weren't very disciplined, didn't show up to work on time, didn't have good professional practice. So going back to the 1920s, 1930s when the school was founded, we as an institution have always had faculty that work and we've always had, or for decades at least, we've had this notion of a sponsored studio project. Where we have a real company, bring a brief, and the students design towards that. Classic linear design methodology. If it's a car design, Ford, Toyota shows up with a brief, students start sketching towards that brief. We go through classic sort of design methodology. We end up with a beautiful finished project. Same with the graphic design, product design, advertising, illustration studio, sponsored project. The two I'm going to show you are not that kind of project. They're actually very different, which is why we think they're interesting. So the first example, we have this, this format we call the design storm, which um, sounds kind of dramatic. It's probably a play off of brainstorm. And design storms are also sponsored projects, uh, very much like a sponsored studio project. The difference being a design storm is a three-day deal, and it's a multidisciplinary project where we, we get a company. Actually, ADP is about to host one um, in a few weeks, so we're excited about that. So in the design storm, we, we students apply. Um, we, we vet the students to make sure they seem like a good fit, they're enthusiastic, have the GPA for it. But then we basically bring in the sponsor, bring in a faculty team, bring in this very transdisciplinary mix of students, and we make our own little design studio for three days solid, and they're amazing. Now, in three days, you don't make that finished, perfect model. This is why I mentioned the sponsored project. We don't get the perfect logo type or the perfect car out of three days locked in a room together. But what we do get is a lot of ideas and a lot of really exciting, sort of low-fidelity, prototyping. Um, this image is from a design storm sponsored by Visa and it was about the future of digital payments. And we developed scenarios, we made lo-fi prototypes, sketch models, acted out scenarios, tons of ideas over three days. Another one of these, which I want to show a little bit more today um, here at World IA Day, was a project we did about two years back sponsored by Microsoft in partnership with Warner Brothers Pictures. And this, this is a really, really interesting one, and I think it has uh, been a great example of how to think through complicated interactions as we look forward into an era when, you know, maybe not everything is screen-based. Maybe we're not wireframing our prototypes. Um, what does this mean sort of as a, a future format for developing ideas and interactions, looking ahead? So this, this design storm was entitled Captivated by Her, the design team, senior design team from Microsoft, the team that works on Windows or the Cortana AI agent, uh, 
actually struck up a partnership with uh, the folks at Warner Brothers, and this coincided with the release of the Spike Jones movie, Her. Actually, who's seen the Spike Jones movie, Her? Good. Okay, we're going to see a little tiny clip of it that's as G-rated as it can possibly be in a moment. Um, and then I'll talk about what this all means. So as you can see, this was called Captivated by Her, a design experiment inspired by Spike Jones's Her. I'm going to play a little snippet. It's a video game example, and we'll talk about that in a second. You're just not being optimistic. You're being very stubborn right now. <laughs> okay, stop walking this direction. It's the other way. Um... Thank you, thank you. Okay, the tunnel on the left is the only one we haven't tried. No, I think that's the one you sent me down where I fell in the pit. Okay, I don't think so. Oh, uh, yeah, this is different. Hello? Do you know how to get out of here? I need to find my ship to get off this plane. Okay, so I had to stop there because of some language issues, but we, you know, we had, um, just in that example, I mean, I'm not going to analyze this too deeply, but you can see this movie, of course, is famous for the fact that the uh, Joaquin Phoenix character kind of developed an emotional relationship with his artificially intelligent agent. But there's actually tons of really wild future scenario examples in this movie. And what we saw here, we have um, this kind of set up a couple projectors, create an immersive environment. We have gestural interface. We do have a character talking to his AI agent on a very personal level, just in that little clip. And this video game character is also kind of artificially intelligent as well. So there's an awful lot happening. And in fact, the movie and the team that presumably put this together as it was in development did a really interesting job of envisioning what this very interconnected, sort of technology-rich, artificially intelligent future could be maybe in a slightly dramatic format, but definitely it's not, you know, it's not crazy. One more quick clip and then we'll talk about what Art Center did. Hey, you just got an email from Mark Lumen. Oh, this woman is gorgeous. She went to Harvard, she graduated magna cum laude in computer science, and she was on the Lampoon. So that means she's funny and she's brainy. Ah, she's fat. Theodore, how long before you're ready? Oh, I've got just the place. Oh, who's that talking? Oh, that's my friend Samantha. Is she a girl? So I had to stop that as well. Um, but <laughs> anyway, we saw the little future phone form factor. We've got, what, a, a dating app built into here, your OS connected with your video game, artificially intelligent video game character that's talking back to you, giving you advice on who's in your dating apps. There's a lot, in, there's a lot to unpack. So the Microsoft team presumably saw that too, and that's why they wanted to do a project around it. So Captivated by Her, which I can't, um, you know, go through the, you know, all the nitty gritty, but um, of what we developed specifically, but we see a couple members of the Microsoft team up in the upper right. You get an idea of what the studio looked like. Ultimately, we pulled themes out of this movie. The future of, let's say, intimacy. What does it mean if everything is AI? If your AI could talk to somebody else's artificial intelligence, what would you trust it to do? I mean, you can, you can start to imagine there's a pile of stuff that we could pull out of even just those two clips that we just saw. We got together and watched the movie up at Art Center before we kicked off the design storm. We did it all together as a group, talked about what it all meant, and then we spent the next three days developing scenarios, and we actually did a lot of acting because it's, you don't really wireframe or start you know, Adobe Illustrator when you want to conceptualize this kind of stuff. So we did a lot of acting. And in this example, we see one of our students who's been assigned the role of the artificial intelligence. So he's got a sign that says AI on his chest. Um, and that kind of low fidelity, scenario-based kind of acting, it was great. I mean, I really, it was great. I think everybody loved it. It was a way for us to wrap our heads around whether ideas made sense or not. In fact, to tie it back to World IA Day, I was reading right here this. If you've ever tried to use something and thought, where am I supposed to go next, or this doesn't make any sense, you're encountering an issue with AI. And in fact, that methodology, we found, was a great way to see when you're running into things that didn't make sense, um, and whether or not, in a way, we're running into issues with AI. So we did, we did lots of scenario development. There is a, a website that actually doesn't show a whole lot of specifics called Captivated by Her, hosted by the Vice Magazine tech blog Motherboard that you can check out if you want to learn a little bit more about it. But there were specifics that came out of these scenarios. These two students were um, in a relationship, moving apart, wanted to maintain intimacy. So one of the products that they developed was some haptic lotion. So I don't, I don't know what, there were lots of little specifics like that. <laughs> 
so this is nuts, right? I mean, this is, this is crazy, crazy business, crazy talk. But again, it's not. And I think that the reason that the Microsoft team came to Art Center um, and what, what wanted to do the project in the first place, but wanted to do that with a bunch of young design students is, I mean, look, these are all real products. And in fact, this is the same kind of stuff that we just saw in the her video clip. We have a virtual environment. We've got a video game platform. We've got an operating system. We have the physical controls for that. And we have artificial intelligence that connects to all of it. So wh where in the heck is this going to go and what is it going to mean? Um, you know, if you're working at Apple or Microsoft or uh, Google or any of, any of these companies today, you're grappling with issues that were conceptualized in a dramatic fashion in the movie Her. And I think it was a great format for us to have a tangible example that we could run with and then start playing with. It was a wonderful project. So, um, and a flip on the traditional studio methodology. So the next example of kind of non-traditional format is something that we do, we've done twice in the interaction program in the upper terms of our curriculum, and we call it Play Studio. And Play Studio, the concept was um, pick a behavior and design for it. So you don't have a client, or you don't have a screen resolution, or a processor, you know, or a technology platform. You have a behavior. So how do you know if you're successful? Well, people do that. They engage in that behavior. So in the case of play, the behavior was play in this example. And obviously, you know, we're kind of intellectual at Art Center, so we spent a lot of time at the front end talking about how do we know if people are playing? What does that mean? I'm going to let some of these clips just kind of run in the background as I talk. These are examples of mock-ups at various stages um, of, of the project. So in the Play Studio, because we're designing for a behavior, we, we make prototypes, sometimes quick lo-fi prototypes of a part of the idea, but we put them in front of real people, because how can you know if you're playing if you're just talking about it? You have to try it. So here we have an idea, what if we let people sketch anywhere on the campus? So there's a mock-up. We put it out in the halls at Art Center and we watched what people did with it. Um, what if we could connect together the disparate parts of Art Center's campus? Is there playful interaction that could come out of that? So we have this sort of uh, virtual here. periscope project. Actually, this came out of the class that Jenny and I just taught uh, last term. So you can, you can talk to people in another building, you can see what's going on, figure out who's on the other. And it's very simple, very playful. Um, and we were able to um, sort of incrementally mock that up and watch which interactions were really working and which weren't. And again, the success criteria is, are people playing? And the way the students started to um, wrap their heads around whether or not that's working, well, is it hard to figure it out? It's got to be low barrier to entry. If you have to ask too many questions, it's probably not a successful design for play. Are people having a sustained engagement? If you look at it once and walk away, it's probably not real play. So something like a flow state, where a user really engages and wants to either figure something out or continue yeah, trying to, to get better at it. So we could, we could put those criteria out front and then use our mock-ups to test against it. And again, I think this methodology is not different at all from what we saw in the previous design storm example, where we're not necessarily working around a known technology platform but we are trying to get people to interact in a very specific way. And I think this is very important as we look <laughs> forward to an era in which, um, you know, in an augmented reality or AI world, I don't know that we're wireframing the way that we have traditionally when we work on interface. I don't know that figuring out the information architecture necessarily involves the kind of, um, I don't want to say necessarily involves the kinds of diagrams, but it certainly doesn't necessarily involve the kinds of diagrams that are showing the relationship between screens, you know, that it used to. And so um, we think this Play Studio is a great way for us to, to, um, to really push, push our interaction design chops around interactions rather than the constraints of, of a technology. This is an example of, a, of an interactive kaleidoscope, 3D camera, user walks up, sees real-time information on the wall that gets piped into a crazy little kaleidoscope that another user can, can turn. In this case, the student uh, set their goals for the project as being um, something that they could do as a three-dimensional installation that two or more people could walk up and have a playful social interaction with. Um, and we think it succeeded very, very, very well. And we think that the, uh, I think that the, the methodologies um, will hold up. And I think what's important about that is that I think the methodologies of this kind of approach to design will hold up regardless of what development tools we're using in the future, what kind of screens we're viewing information on. They're kind of technology agnostic. 
We put our students through these courses in their upper terms after they've had a solid grounding in the fundamentals. They've taken JD's class. People know how to develop sites uh, or screen layouts and UI for web, have done app-based design, and then we start playing with this stuff. So we sort of try to ground you in the fundamentals and then open up, open up the methodology to something a, a little bit more um, rooted in the core human behavior and a little bit less connected to the specifics of the technology. So that's all I've got. I wanted to share those two examples. And if you've got questions about it, I guess hit us up with them later. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Jenny Rodenhaus. Thank you, World IA Day, and thank you, Maggie. Um, so I'm presenting some of my graduate work that I completed here um, at Art Center. Um, and it's called Sensor Salon, and it shows collaborative processes and methodologies used to design wearable technology. Um, so when I started uh, working on this, I collaborated with uh, Christine Ortega on the project. Um, we made this observation that the population of wearable tech and people wearing wearable tech was growing. So how um, would we support this technology moving forward and what systems and services needed to be in place in order to support them? Um, so I'm gonna take you through our, our um, process. I'm gonna take you from start to finish our design process. Um, so where we began was looking at existing services, existing places where people could go and get um, essentially wearables attached to their body. So we went and sat through um, a two-hour nail installation uh, service. I don't know um, if anyone's ever gotten gel nails um, put onto them, but it takes about two hours. It's essentially plastic being put onto your nail, um, and it has a really long uh, lifetime. So um, the interesting thing to us when we were um, experiencing this, this is me wearing a GoPro, by the way, was that over time, the two-hour process, my relationship grew with this technician. So we started off with the negotiation, a small talk, gossip, moving into therapy. So she knew quite a, <laughs> about, a lot about me by the time I left, um, good or bad. But um, the great thing was is that you also have to return for de-installation. So there is this like um, relationship that grows over time because I had to return to get the plastic and um, we also got like a, I got a skull put onto my fingertips, so I had to get that taken off um, in a couple weeks when it was time. Um, so really, we were inspired by this process, this process of self-maintenance, um, and wondered what it would be like to apply to wearable technology. And the nail art community is super experimental, so we found it really inspiring. So we started prototyping an installation service for wearable tech and kind of using nails or this concept of sensor extensions um, and building um, prototypes. Uh, you can see one over there where it's combining um, essentially nails and uh, sensors. And so from this, we were wondering about like, what is this as like this new salon as physical space? What new, new tools would you need to apply uh, technology to people's fingertips? Um, and we found that it was more like the process and the packaging of wearable technology was kind of getting more exposed um, and being, we we're being more transparent with our customers. And we also, through this process, began prototyping nails. So it's this wonderful blend of uh, nail aesthetics with uh, maker culture. So you'd see like uh, gems uh, with uh, different LED lights, a 3D printed cat, of course, to host an LED light, um, and different program programming sensors to have different uh, kind of personalities and feedback to the user. So we created this like whole array, kind of this like whole platform to kind of prove out that um, we could have like, we could source power, like the nails themselves could uh, create power using piezos, and then uh, we could um, use different 3D printing technology to extend the fingertips so it could host more sensors. Um, and then we also then explored different inputs and outputs uh, with different haptic feedback. 
Of course, we had to do a user testing session. <laughs> so we, we invited two people in, and we installed our um, sensor extensions onto their fingertips. <laughs> and this was a great way for us to also prototype the actual sort of salon installation process for ourselves, because we hadn't done it. Um, so this is uh, Christina uh, applying onto Devin. And then we ran them through just simple tasks, like picking up things. And um, Chrissy here is wearing a set that would buzz when she gets into pro within the proximity of a certain object. So we'd give her haptic feedback. Um, and she said, as she was wearing it, she was like, this kind of hurts. Um, but she did come away saying, I would use these nails if I wanted to quit smoking. So it's kind of this moment for us that we realized by going through this process and creating these nails, it really helped uh, people speculate for us, like push the concept even further. And that we realized that the service was much more about helping people realize their own personal desires. So we wanted to then design that. And we kind of started with that question of like, what new services can support the growing need to more personalize wearable technology? So as we were going through it, we were making a list thinking like, oh, who would work there? What tools would we need? And the interesting thing is if you use Chrissy as the example, if she wanted to stop smoking, you're like, okay, well, you kind of maybe would need like a doctor there to monitor that progress. You would need nail artists to help apply. Uh, you need a developer, interaction designers, industrial designers, maybe a therapist, who knows? But we like that it became more about like the people and the people who work there. So quickly the service kind of grew to a company, not only the wearable products, but then the people who were applying, and then all these different tools and materials that were like blended between maker culture and nail art. Um, so we opened up a sensor salon in my apartment um, as a prototype. And so we kind of, you could think of the space as like a wireframe. Um, we had all these uh, drawn backdrops to kind of make it feel like a salon. And we hired a nail artist. We hired a lot of these, these are all art center students, industrial designers, interaction designers, developers. And then we had one client. We, all of these people around just one client. Uh, we invited, um, her for the day and we started the day just by like showing her all the different sensors so it became kind of this education process and then um, started brainstorming and she based on what she wanted and what she needed and then the, you saw the the room sort of split in half she went with the nail artist and everyone well, else went to the other side and started to get working so we could fine-tune everything according to our client size of fingertips so we created like 3D printed like a lion's head three different times to get it to fit right. Um, but it kind of proved out this like process of how long it took. And we spent the entire day with her. Um, and so again, it's kind of like prototyping that relationship between the technician and our cl client, the person we're wearing all of this wearable technology. And this is kind of like the end result. And a lot of sensors couldn't fit on her fingertips, and that, but that really wasn't the point. We still got to her to experience um, what it might be like, and again, sort of speculate for us. Um, but the main point I wanted to bring up here was it kind of introduces this uh, appointment, this uh, that she could come to us again and get these deinstalled. So you would place them on, she would have to come back, and we'd have to literally clip the LEDs off of her nails, which were, um, again, we we're using gel nail, like the plastic, to um, embed them. Um, but we really like this idea of like this appointment reoccurring, and we could also keep track of everything that she had installed on the previous session, so that relationship with our client would grow over time. And these are um, lots, lots of outcomes came from this process. So, like uh, we investigated new culture and aesthetics, that blending of um, nail art, maker culture, salon culture, and maker lab, like fusing together. Um, wearable tech disruption. So again, it was like became much more of like an ecosystem rather than just focusing on one perfect object. Um, and then this concept of made to order. So people coming in and um, it, like 
pushing the personalization and customization of wearable tech even further. And then the, a new service model, so a physical storefront that you could go and get your wearable tech uh, customized, altered, kind of this digital tailor. Um, so thank you so much. Invite um, Todd and JD to come back on stage. So, just we do a little swap out of some of our microphones. JD, do you want to come on up and grab a stool? I'd like to um, invite you guys to come and ask some questions if you have either to our panelists individually or as a whole. But one of the things I wanted to throw out at our panelists as we do some of the microphone changeover is the following. Um, when I was a young IA, all those years ago, I spent a lot of time doing mapping and arborescence and taxonomies and cladistic analysis and things like that. What I hear you talking about today is problem finding, process, and people, rather than artifacts. And I wondered, um, as we, we do the changeover, you want to just think about what does that mean for you today? How do you, how do you see that shift towards process and people away from artifacts? How do you, how do you describe and communicate what it is you actually do? That's my question. Think up your own. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if I don't know if we're on yet. As soon as it's on, so just consider that. I also have to make a comment. I'm really proud of our faculty here at Art Center. I think they do astounding work with our students, but also in their own practice. So thank you, all three of you, for talking to us today. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a quick shot at that. I mean, I think that if you, if you go back in, in time, let's say to product design, it would be clear what the art, like if you have a, I think we're seeing as the technology landscape becomes more and more interconnected, the tools we use to develop change faster, or there are more of them. It feels like in a lot of the interaction design projects that we're taking on, there's just more and more variables. And so you may not have time to make um, necessarily a single artifact. In fact, the solution may not be a single artifact. It may be a couple of different ones. So um, we're, uh, yeah, we've been finding a need to maybe work a little bit more lo-fi. But when you work lo-fi, you still have to hang it onto something solid. Mm -hmm. So a good solid scenario. Um, or a test with people is that maybe that solid thing that you can connect it to. So that, that would be my answer. I, I'm going to agree with Todd. I think one of the things working at ADP that I try to introduce is being able to tell a story. Being able to understand who your users are enough to then take them through the context of beginning to end, and that goes back to the Rosenfeld and Morfell, Morvell circle of context, content and audience. What's their environment? Who are they? What are they doing? What are they managing or handling in their daily lives? And being able to take the, those potential users' personas through a story from beginning to end, and then being able to tell a story, and out of that story, then you can start pulling information um, and potentially not artifacts, but paper prototyping, affinity diagramming, some ways to really understand and arrange and organize that information to help people move forward and come up with a solution. So less about artifacts and more about understanding the process and the people and in their world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess I can build off that on saying that um, I think I think I'm really interested in how we're more co like co-designing with our users and getting them involved earlier in the process. And I think a way in which to go about that is by it's sort of less intimidating to them when you can um, give them something sort of rough um, from the get-go. It feels um, that then it's not so terrifying to critique it. and. Um, and they're like sort of more involved right from the get-go, and I find that really inspiring. And um, 
and helps drive the project forward um, quicker. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite anybody in the audience who has a question either to stand up and shout out or to come down to our microphone down here and ask a question. Do we have any questions or comments? Please, I see at the back here. ADP? The dashboard for the, um, the ADP human capital um, dashboard. I think that that animation was an attempt by the Chelsea Lab. It actually came out of ADP's Chelsea Innovation Lab. And what they were trying to do is communicate with executives the future vision. So they actually are starting to roll that out bit by bit. Um, it hasn't in its entirety isn't out to um, ADP some of ADP's clients yet But the intention of that video was to communicate within the company and to executives the future facing vision of what the product could be compared to what it had been <laughs> I'll tell the designers at Chelsea. I'm sure they'll be happy to hear that Any further questions? Please. Yeah, I guess from, from what I'm saying, when we're focusing on profit and control, maybe that is the future to focus on profit and control. How do you, like right now as designers, we are uh, people who want to be better at the craft, right? We go off and we produce books and we go do projects by ourselves to produce these artifacts, produce these designs. But it seems like if you're focusing on people and process, how do we get better at doing those things? Does that make sense? Yeah. Design is going to change. Yeah, I'll, maybe maybe we can all take a crack at that. But one of the things, so I'll tell you that I get this question in class a lot, and um, and one of the things I like to say about that is that um, it, this augurs well for maybe the number of jobs in the interaction design IA design p professions. You know, simply because. Um, it seems like there's going to be, just professionally speaking, a little bit more specialization occurring. I mean, there already is specialization, but I think, I think that's going to continue. But um, I know that I, also, I mean, I like to focus on a craft too, um, but I've also found that, you know, there's also a craft in, like in this design storm example. There's a way to do that right, and there's a way to do it not so right, and actually just figuring out how to do it right is kind of a craft too, and I, I kind of enjoy that. But I am also, you know, guilty of sometimes liking to get a really simple project that I can just make, you know, and finish rather than the super complicated systems one. So um, I, th I think it's both of those things. There's a yeah, maybe I'll hand it over. But yeah, I think one of the things that we're playing with and starting to experiment with at ADP is much more collaborative research and design processes where originally, I've, I've only been at ADP for a few months, but one of the things I've tried to introduce is collaborative research where the product owner and the designer and the developer go out into the field and they actually have the opportunity to interact and watch and observe users in their environment, see their struggles, see their pain, and then we come back, we debrief, and we actually have an opportunity collaboratively as a team to start thinking about solutions that's where the storytelling comes in, where we all come back with that visceral experience deeply embedded into the psyche as a team about, gosh, that was really painful to watch. And that process of being able to collaborate together and design together and ideate together becomes much more of a participatory experience across this cross-functional team who are kind of trying to solution. Jenny? Jenny, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I, I do think, yes, we'll see more of roles of like designer as facilitator, but I also think, yeah, there's, we don't always start from that point in the process so early on, and there's plenty of projects out there that it's, yeah, you, you don't have time to do that upfront work, and it is all about that beautiful execution. Um, so I think it is kind of this, it is a back and forth. It really is, at the end of the day, it's, it's we kind of have to, do uh, lots of different things and wear lots of different hats. Um, I'm sure, do you feel that way as a practitioner?
I actually have a, a, a couple of thoughts on that too, just like jumping in on this is um, having been both on the engineering technology side of the house and in the design side of the house, I kind of, inf I think the interaction information architect has a real role to play in facilitating communication between them as well as with the end user. And I also invite some designers as we have in design world is not to, to understand that their work is not precious. And that's why we try to introduce low fidelity prototyping. What does interaction design look like? Well, it looks like a lot of post-its and a lot of affinity diagrams and a lot of whiteboarding, right? Messy. Which is, is very messy. And that's, if you've ever been to see our galleries, that's very different from a traditional art and design school where there is a ta-da moment. Literally, we have a grand opening and it's ta-da with a spotlight on the object. And when your object has a lot of post-its, it's, it, you know, you have to have a backup story, right? Um, and I also do encourage designers to be the ones who have to explain that their work is not about ornamentation, it's about instrumentation. It's about facilitation. And what we can do is we can help people visualize that and embody it very quickly and in a way that can be very malleable at the end stages. Likewise, though, I also invite our designers to understand what data is, understand how algorithms work, understand how software is designed, developed, and produced, and that it can be very easy to develop a concept. It's very hard to understand a product roadmap when it's in its third and fourth version and you have existing users that you're migrating to new platforms and engaging with new technologies. So I also invite designers to take that on board, too. Right? The old-fashioned software development life cycle taught us a lot, even if we use Agile today. Right? Likewise, I also invite our, our engineers, if you like, or the more technology-driven um, participants in the team project to understand that we don't have definitive, finalized requirements in the world anymore and that their job is also to help think of creative solutions around that, what it could be, how it could behave, what it could do, how it could connect. And I think that the information architects, interaction designer is the glue for that team also. So it's a, it's a very humbling role, but I think it's a role that if you keep putting the user first, you're gonna have much better outcomes than if any single driver I don't know if that answers your question, but it's definitely not about the ornamentation and the decoration, for sure. Yeah, if you look at all of our examples today from our group, um, there was only one or two user interfaces in the GUI, classic GUI. The rest were all different gestural, voice, movement, sensor-driven interactions. Well, I'll just say, um, I think, as interaction designers, user researchers, I think in the past there's been this preciousness, I wanna do this in isolation, I don't want someone else to impede upon my craft. I think there's um, this wonderful collaboration that is now starting to happen as technology becomes more sophisticated and the, the visual aspect or the UI becomes a little more fluid. You bring in people like developers who are actually creative in their own way, in their own right, who if you collaborate with them in the right way and they understand the user and the problem, they can come up with some pretty amazing solutions themselves. And to be that facilitator in terms of that discussion, to bring the corporation, the executives, the user, the developer, and all those people together, that's when the solutions get really amazing. comments or more questions? Well, from I, our I totally agree with you on that because yeah it's, it's software it's never complete it's always being updated so I, yeah I, I agree that's probably why we're going much more towards process because it's just continuous we're always we're always refining the product even when it's out there. I think we have a question back.
do both. Um, at, at ADP, we do, we do both. Um, I actually kind of have set up a, at ADP, I introduced this first collaborative um, design method for a particular project. And I started with a room with post-its. We actually did a, a, a kickoff where we went out into the field with assumptions. Everybody collaboratively, the product owner, the developer, the designer, myself, we came up and established this is what we're going to be in the field looking for. Everybody was taking was supposed to take notes. We came back, we started a room where we had all the affinity notes from the research, and then while I did a report and I looked at the transcripts, everybody could go into that room and look at the information and continuously reabsorb what they had experienced. It became a place where people started bringing in executives and other developers on other teams, and it became this way, this hub of being able to share out that information. So when I actually did deliver the final report to people who were outside of the office, there are other people who had been on the team could speak to it as well. So it's just another kind of uh, artifact to facilitate, but it's not the only artifact. Thank you. Me... Do we have any final questions? Okay, I wanted to ask our um, panel to finish up just on one easy or one not so easy um, comment. And that is just what your final comments are on how you see information architecture, interaction design, being able to focus as its world of application becomes so wide reaching. Are there certain things you think that we should be focusing on that we're not? I'm going to wiggle around it a tiny bit, but, but I want to tie it back to the Play, the play Studio example. So, um, um, and it, maybe it kind of relates to the previous question too, but I think um, building on what, what JD just said. Like for example, in the design storm, we get the, we get the brief, we read the reports, we hear the, we, the sponsor tells us, um, here's what we're trying to accomplish, here's what we've learned, here's some of our research. From a teaching pedagogy standpoint, the students might listen, they might not. They kind of listen most of the time, but then as soon as you, as soon as we find you have to start mocking it up and, and trying it, maybe even testing it just with your classmate, I feel like that research has to become more real. And Play Studio is the same thing. It's like, okay, great, you've got this great idea. It's a beautiful keynote, nice graphic. Let's go make one and let's go see if it works. So I, I just think that methodology-wise, it's important to find a way to take it out, you gotta do the research, you have to. You have to figure out the relationship of all the components of the system, diagram that, you have to do it. But I just, I think that what I've been noticing is the faster we can then take that and turn it into something that real people can beat up and try, then the quicker then we can know what the next step needs to be. So that's what we've been trying in these classes and that's probably the best way that I could attempt to answer that question. I'm gonna just riff off that and agree. I think when I was first teaching at Art Center and I was introducing the method and telling the students they actually had to go outside the walls of Art Center to go out and talk to real people, there was a little bit of, a little bit of shock from the students. They were like, oh my God, um, talk to real people. I also said if you, at the end of this class, come back with something beautiful but you can't tell me who it's for and what problem it's solving, then you'll fail the class. So I think what, what we're not doing enough of, I think, or we're starting to do more of at Art Center is really allow the students the time to move through the iterative process of putting their work and not being precious about it in front of users, getting feedback, being critical with themselves within their teams. The same thing needs to happen at corporations where that iterative process of putting something early out there, knowing it might break, we're trying to break it, doing it again, and knowing it's an iterative process and that a final outcome, it's actually never final, but it's a continuing process from MVP all the way to continuously refining it based on feedback from real users. Um, and I'll add like something that I think was great that came out of the Play Studio was that uh, we started students off with not really a brief. It was just completely open-ended, so there was no persona, there was no problem to solve, and getting them to start making in which to define and, def and define that brief for themselves, I think is something that we're trying to do more and more. Um, and getting people to kind of play and um, as a way in which to discover these and deal with these more open-ended problems in emerging technologies. 
So I'd like to um, thank our panel today and turn it back over to Weston. We're going to get, uh, we're going to keep moving and head up to our next session. I'm trying, uh, Hunter, I'm allowing space over here if you can get plugged in um, as you go. I think we're, we're doing pretty well on time, but um, um, we're not, we're not going to um, take a break, a, a full break right now, just kind of move through. Thank you, Maggie and Todd and JD and Jenny. Thank you for sharing with us. Really appreciate that. It's a great way to kick off our day. Um, and now we are going to be hearing from Hunter, Hunter Oaks. Um, Hunter and I, uh, I used to work with Hunter at Capital Group, where he is now. Yes. And um, Hunter's a UX lead there at Capital Group. And he's going to be sharing some really interesting things with us about understanding audiences. And so I think it's, you know, it's a nice uh, kind of carryover of, of some of the themes that, that you all were talking about from the Art Center group and in terms of, of Focusing our, you know, our work on understanding audience and context, and how, how we how we can think about that effectively. Um, this could, yeah, let's see. If you do need to drop in a card, you could possibly take care of that while we're getting set here. Um, all right, and. Regarding uh, questions, uh, when we do questions, uh, if we have time for questions at the end of Hunter's session, um, I will ask that you try to come to our mic. I think we will be able to also have a, a, a mic that we can come to some of you with in the back part, um, just because we are streaming and I think it'll be helpful for folks um, to hear the questions. So um, I'll try to help out with that, Hunter, when time comes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Weston, and good morning. So when we want to understand a business in our discipline, we create a business model. When we want to understand tasks, we create tasks models. When we want to understand an industry, we create an industry model. And when we want to understand an audience, we create personas, usually. That's kind of, uh, there is that concept of the audience model. Uh, I see it when I Google it, but I've not really seen it as a concept, and I'm proposing that maybe that is a meaningful thing to think about, um, but I'd also love any discussion afterwards on whether you use that term. It really came more out of a discussion with Weston that we thought, we really do audience modeling, and personas are just one way to do that, but don't have to be the only way. So I wanna show a case study here, and deliberately we'll go into deep detail, which I'm sure if you are UX designers or a specialists, you don't mind. That's what we do during the day. So I'll try to, I'll sort of deliberately, we'll make it not too abstract and really show the actual problems, which I hope would also be interesting for people who uh, don't work as, as large and traditional as an, at an enterprise as I do, just to give a little insight of what that is like in a company. It was surprising to me when I joined this company. So I work at Capital Group now, been there for three years, and it's one of the largest investment management organizations. So just like Va Vanguard or Fidelity, uh, American Funds is the mutual fund brand that Capital Group does. And they're right up there with Fidelity in terms of assets under management, but many of us have not heard of them because they don't, unlike Fidelity, they don't sell directly to consumers. So if you're a financial advisor, or if you have a financial advisor, you know them, but you know, we don't advertise on TV or anything like that. It's sort of a little bit behind the scenes. And it's also a privately hold, held company. So right there, also not that public. But it's big, like over 7,000 people work there in 23 offices around the world. Headquarters is Los Angeles, so I work downtown. And uh, some of my colleagues are actually here. Weston also used to work there. Founded in 1931, so that right there, I hope also for some of you who work at tech firms, where digital might be at the core, 
this is pretty different. So the main product is not a digital product. The product is mutual funds that are far from digital. And they're pretty virtual, but they're not like people don't, you know, really deal with that online. And in fact, much of the financial industry, especially with dealing with advisors, is not really very digital heavy. They're, they're kind of behind. Uh, the company has a pretty substantial digital team, though. So there's 77 people in the digital group, content strategy, graphic design, UX design, content operations. There's five UX leads, so I'm one of five of them who lead little teams of those, you know, UX designer, writer, graphic designer, business analysts, digital product managers, pretty substantial analytics group. And they're all part of integrated marketing. So then there's also Marcom and, and, st and strategic marketing. All right, so that's his background about me. And I will dive into this project now and to show you how we made sense of an audience. The, the, the project itself is developing a mutual fund analysis tool that serves the needs of pretty complicated audiences. And so there's really two components to that. That's why this picture is here. There's an online component, sort of a digital view this thing on the web, and then the thing also makes a PDF output deck. And it really serves financial advisors, so very special audience group, as they then talk to their clients about specific funds. And we're talking here about the 401k space, so you know, retirement plans, so if any of you have a 401k plan, uh, you know that your employer at some point made a choice to go with some mutual funds that are in your lineup that you can pick from and it's that process that we're talking about some some financial advisor goes to the employer and says I think you should put those funds into your lineup and as American funds of course we want to be in that lineup so here are the challenge is make a tool that allows people to compare these mutual funds and the fine line is here you know you kind of want to make American funds look good but you don't want to be perceived as cherry picking and so it's a very interesting communications challenge. So here are some of the challenges. There are over a dozen user roles when we're thinking about the audience. There is another challenge in that some of those audiences are company internal, i.e. those on the left actually work at Capital Group and then there's people on the right here that are external. That's pretty different from projects that I had worked on before, where serving both of those is uh, not trivial. Another challenge is that these audiences here are highly specialized and pretty unfamiliar to the UX team. So when I worked in previous jobs, so for instance, when I worked at Disney, uh, the audience are people who go to theme parks, such as this one. And I kind of know those people. Like, I go to theme parks. They're pretty familiar. Or when I worked at DirecTV, the audience is, People who watch TV, I know people like that. <laughs> but now, when I joined Capital Group, like my audience is people like a client relationship manager. I've never met one in my life. I don't know their needs. And that's true for most of the people in the digital team. So some of them have been with the company, but most of us come from other industries. So that's a pretty different challenge here. Like, and, and they really are different. I mean, if you know financial advisors, you know, they have, they have yeah. <laughs> so we need some kind of conceptual model of the audience to describe them, their similarities, their differences, to understand their needs, and then of course also to test our tool iteratively, like who do we test this with. This project came to us from the marketing team, so they gave us a brief. Here is the actual brief with a little bit of sanitizing, but you see here, there they they describe the target audience right there. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that was true for me too when I got this. Like, I, who, what, I, what are these acronyms? And once you actually even think about it harder, you realize there's actually overlap. Like it says secondary audience are share sellers, but some of the primary are also are share sellers. And it, it, it really was not, like we couldn't take that as gospel. We need to make our own sense of the audience. And one of the first steps that I have done and that I pretty almost always do now, which is useful regardless that I highly recommend, uh, we did here too, which is a activity from the Game Storming book by Dave Gray, Sonny Brown, and James McAnufo. And they pr propose the stakeholder analysis, which actually, I, th 
think if they use it more for make sense out of the people on your project team. And, and so I highly recommend it. So the idea is basically you make a grid of <clears throat> uh, interest in that project or the outcome of the project on the, on the y-axis and then the x-axis has power or influence over that project. And you just bring a core team together of stakeholders and team members and just put names up, like who are the people and where do they fall in our project? At Capital Group, we use initials, so these actually stand for names, so typically these actually be names. And so just put people up, and when a few things happen usually in our company, what happens usually is like, holy cow, there's a lot of people that we actually need to keep in mind here, and so that's usually useful. Let's bring that out so that then I work with the project manager to plan our communications. How much do we need to review stuff with these guys all along the way? Um, but a few other things happen too. So, but just to explain this a little bit more, so upper left-hand corner, basically high interest but low influence are the end users. Right? They use this thing, but they don't, they don't work on the project. They kind of have to take it as it comes. Upper right-hand corner, the core team. We have high interest and we really influence that thing. Left-hand, lower left-hand is at an enterprise like ours where digital is basically almost like an in-house agency that serves. That's kind of where digital leadership sits because they have actually not as much power over the project as you know, the big fund managers or directors of our company. So they sit there. And then the bottom right is interesting because pretty much always when you draw that, it turns out empty at first. You think, well, who is there? But it's actually a kind of a danger zone, right? These are the people that don't have interest in your project yet but very high influence. So they could be somebody like a senior exec who that thing isn't even on their radar yet, but all of a sudden they get wind of it. It's like, what are you doing? And they can now swoop in and really screw up your project. So I am paying particular attention always now to this and ask, like, who is there? Who do we need to worry about who could really sabotage us and, um, and you know, influence us later? Um, we clean that up then usually, you know, and that goes into our SharePoint shared site and you create sort of some interesting bubbles too where you realize, oh yeah, I can see working team users, so these, you know, can shape up differently in different projects. But so interestingly here is now that, you know, users are there, our external users, but we have our internal users, um, sorry, upper left hand corner actually are, so some of those are our internal company users, so the salespeople at the group, right? They will use that tool. Um, and then we have these user representatives. They're people who deal with our users so they can be good, good proxies for us to talk to. Okay, so that out of the way, then we went, what's your typical next step? What do you do if you want to figure out your audience? Uh, you kind of go, ah, personas. First question is usually, do we have personas? And at Capital Group, we have a bunch of personas. But this is very specialized, so we have some for advisors, some for investors, but we don't really have personas for these, so it's not like I could go to those. So the question becomes, well, do we make one? And our first instinct was, sure, yeah, let's try that. And uh, actually, quick show of hands, who here has actively created personas or been on a team who, who does? That's a lot of people. Who has some kind of skepticism about them? Or? Okay, okay. <laughs> So we know they're not perfect. And, uh, so we created an activity here. We knew we're not gonna have the budget to really create full-blown personas, but there is this idea of ad hoc personas that uh, Tamar Adlin and John Pruitt describe in their book. And so we actually did that workshop first and thought, well, let's try to create provisional personas so that then we can focus on the most relevant users and the most relevant actions. And I'll actually go into detail on what we did here. So that's uh, so stage one, this was a few hours of work right here. And so you see the orange stickers here are basically the categories of tool users. And we don't have to really fully understand them, but it gives you an idea here of just what the team, so this was a core team of, the, the, uh, actually I should quickly say also, the core team here was really a nice interdisciplinary group of digital, so me as a UX lead, marketing, and then a product specialist, so somebody who really knew this mutual fund. And that team stayed together throughout the lifespan, is still together, so it's been a long-term project. Uh, that 
definitely has been incredibly useful. So together, you know, we put all of those user groups up, and one thing that you see, given how many there are, well, these probably are not personas, right? 20, uh, that would be hard, to, hard for us to manage. Uh, interestingly, usually when you do these kind of activities, patterns emerge, right, without you even planning for it. So here, very naturally, somehow, magically, they're kind of arranged left to right by a level of sophistication. So on the left, is that at all legible? Not really? Okay. Um, I'll tell you a little bit. So they, they read like client relationship manager, uh, consultant relationship manager. So these are company internal people who are, of course, experts in that tool. In the middle are the advisors. So they are at least financially experts, but they're not necessarily experts in our mutual fund and American funds. And on the right is the employer who that's not their job to worry about, right? They make widgets, but they will have a 401k plan. So they sort of arranged, pretty kind of naturally uh, came out that way. And so then the next step, very much out of the playbook, is you create these assumptions and you write down sticky notes, which are in the format of person plus goal, activity, action, or problem. And so here I show you just three of those yellow sticky notes. Uh, an advisor wants to automate a repetitive process, i.e. they need to pitch this thing to money, 401k plan employers. Or this next one here, an advisor wants to prove to a sponsor, a little uh, explanation of lingo, plan sponsor is the same as the employer. So the, right. Uh, advisor wants to prove to a sponsor that the existing target date fund, that happens to be what we're talking about here, is not good so that then he can play over the, take over the plan, right? Does that make sense? So in a 401k plan, the advisor goes in and is like, you should really consider redoing your 401k plan. I bet that has happened to many of you. It certainly happened to me, to me many times, all of a sudden halfway through my tenure at a company is like, we're changing our retirement plan, and I have no idea why and what it means for me. And usually it's kind of motivated because it dirty secret, it helps the plan sponsor with their own tax situation. Um, third one here, example, advisor assistant. An advisor assistant wants to prepare a meeting material for an advisor sponsor meeting. And so then in the activity, you write all those down. Everybody writes them down, puts them up, and then there's time spent clustering them, and you're beginning to see some patterns. The next step here is one that isn't in the book because it doesn't really apply to other projects, but here came up. And I want to show this also to show how important it is to stay flexible when you're doing these kinds of activities. Uh, we realized that with our tool, there's really always two people who use it. There's the person who uses that tool, but they're always talking to somebody else about what it means. So there's basically a subject, the person who uses it, and an object, the person that they're using it for. So with our internal audience here, the, the capital group Salesforce is trying to pitch something to an advisor, another word for advisor is intermediary. So their target are intermediaries. For these people in the internal, their target is the sponsor. For these people, the target is the home office. For the advisors themselves, their target is the plan sponsor, right? So there are always these two audiences now, which I hadn't really seen broken up that way. I don't know if that's formally, if I've ever seen that in a, in a persona analysis. Uh, this plan sponsor in the end, they don't have a target. They're just the recipient of that PDF output deck, and they, they don't talk to anybody about it. Uh, I think another step, uh, I forget if that's in the book or not, but we're sort of do, describing context here. So when I was seeing uh, the team immediately realized, okay, so what, when do people use this? So the capital group internal people use this tool for others and as a sales aid. The intermediaries use it for themselves to inform themselves, and they also inform others. So we're adding context notes here, content sticky notes. And then the last step in the ad hoc persona workshop world is usually you're reclustering and reassimilating, and you see we've since moved to a different room here. Thankfully, we had our post-its on white paper and not on the wall, so we could just take the whole thing with us. Uh, so this is you know the second session with many hours here. You're now creating the underlying goals, so the underlying motivations. Why those yellow sticky notes before were much more functional, now is the underlying motivation of 
I want this or I need that. So here the underlying motivation for those people on the left are I want to prove the value of capital group and American funds. I want to enhance our brand or we want to demonstrate our thought leadership. Um, just give you some examples like this person. I want to select the best targeted fund for a specific client, a specific sponsor. This person's motivation is I want to collaborate with a sponsor. I want to empower the plan sponsor. So these sort of underlying motivations. And now through uh, the, the next step then, again, we're still in the, the model of the ad hoc persona workshop is you try to reclassify your users and recategorize them and here's sort of a first stab at, at, at organizing them and creating subcategories. Um, I'll show you that a little bit more cleaned up, but I also wanted to deliberately show that uh, it doesn't instantly look like a nice chart like this, and I feel like sometimes I get intimidated when I go online and look something up, journey map, and it's like, oh my god, this thing is gorgeous, and I don't see the stuff that they threw away in the middle, or, and I, I feel like sometimes at our company, working with people, with junior people, or when teaching, it's a little intimidating, I don't even know where to start, and I just have to always say, well, just put something down. Like, it can be messy, as you were saying earlier, right? Like, ah, there's this, uh, this importance of just put something down. But anyway, so here's our first, really, audience model, and you see now the, a few things here emerge that I think are important and worth pointing out and that I didn't really expect beforehand. So the, the white boxes with the drop shadow are the most granular. So these are the 17 professional roles almost the 20 orange sticky notes we had before. We eliminated three because they weren't that important. Um, but I think what we realized here is really in the personas now the next step would be, right, you try to collapse them and simplify them and which could we stick together. And honestly, like, we could not justify that here. So I'll show you just a few examples, just how all of these are different. We kind of needed to keep these 17 around which makes you want to go, oh, but I want fewer, I can't do 17 personas. And so here for me was sort of the first time of like, uh, I don't know that we should be doing personas, and maybe not. So example, the leftmost client relationship manager, they work, so they would use this tool and show it to a plan sponsor. The, the retirement plan consultant, they would use the tool, but would show it to an advisor. So totally different user group with totally different um, expertise. The, Second group, the retirement plan counselor, the RPC, works in the field, while the RPSC, the retirement plan sales consultant, works in the home office at Capital Group and just supports the RPC. So they work differently. They work in a different place. So right there, right in persona land, like I wouldn't throw those together because one thing needs to work on an iPad, the other guy sits at his desk with a big monitor and would, hating, would, would hate to have a small screen. Uh, the consultant relationship manager works with a totally more sophisticated audience than these other ones. So I, I'll spare you going through all of them, but I can really justify uh, you can't collapse these. Like They're really, really different. Um, I think the other thing is at a company that's been around for 80 years, that company kind of knows its users actually pretty well. So it's not like you want to reinvent the wheel and there's actually a little bit of risk. I, th I think I think it was easier 10 years ago for me when I brought personas to a project. People were kind of excited. They might not have seen it. And just go, oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. I think now most people have heard about it and there's a lot of emotion around that. So it could also often be the case that, you know, you, as the digital teams, do we want to make personas? And then the marketing team says, but why do you make the personas? We own the personas. And you get into this, there's a lot of politics around personas, so they can also be really, iffy. It's, it, it sounds like a straightforward thing, but it's a little bit like maybe designing the company Christmas card, right? It sounds like a good idea, but oh my God, everybody will have an opinion about it. You're never going to get done. You're like, why the f did I sign up for that? <laughs> I think personas can be a little bit like that. So it was here where we're beginning to realize, you know, maybe we don't need to go that extra step and do our personas. Um, okay, next thing to point out about this model that I think is important. Uh, we have these sort of the, the most granular, 17 boxes here. We have the least granular, which is the gray boxes, people who work at CG, Capital Group, people who are intermediaries, i.e. advisors, and the plan sponsor, i.e. the employer. So we have these different tiers. And then there is an in-between level of granularity, five segments, right? So uh, one here, 
this here, intermediary sales, this whole group, intermediary, and then two more groups here. Very much based on the usage scenarios that came out of the second uh, application of yellow sticky notes earlier on. And so this, I am suggesting here that this sort of having different levels of focus is incredibly useful in an audience model. And then you grab at whatever tier serves you later for when you use it. And I'll show how that, how that applies. Okay, the next step then after this was we did a scenario workshop and since we had a core team with very educated, very, very knowledgeable people, we could really just write down or work out these scenarios, do some iterations. Uh, we ended up with 11 important scenarios where we really just asked like, which of these does the tool need to support. So for instance, a capital group, client relationship manager works with a sponsor collaboratively to compare target date funds for sale, right? So these are the kinds of scenarios here. And we, this is just the summary. Each of those is fleshed out. I show you just one or two of them. So here you see we're using the middle tier of a granularity of our audience model. So at the top we have those five groups. And one is always the subject the dark blue one and the dark gray one is the object. So as we're going through, this, through the scenario, so here I'll show you another one. Now the, the actor and the, the object is the different one. And then we just sort of fleshed out a bit more of these scenarios. Uh, retirement plan consultant demonstrates the target date fund evaluator tool, this thing we're working on, to an R retirement plan focused advisor. Later he shows how the advisor can access the tool themselves for their own sponsor meetings. So we fleshed those out, put some goals beyond beneath it, strategy, supporting materials, and then bottom row we also ranked them. So this we did through dot voting, multiple rounds, bring in more stakeholders, so everybody felt like they invested. And basically after this we sort of had uh, which of these scenarios are the most important, or another way to put it would be if our tool really helps with that top scenario, we will have done a job. Or if a tool fails at that thing, we will have really screwed it up. And then with that now, we have the top scenarios and we have which audiences are most, uh, most affected by them. And so we can now put those priorities into our audience model. So that's the one last step for the audience model. Those blue boxes now show just how important they are. And that got chopped around a little bit and changed around a little bit when a senior Exec really felt like, no, your one, two, three here are not quite right, so one more t tweak here. And now this is really kind of a, what I'm proposing here is a, an audience model. We have a, we've sort of classified and made sense out of a mess in a way that, that, that really served us. And I'll go a little bit into now how it served us, how we use that audience model, so some examples of what it did for us. One big thing it did for us was using it in design reviews. Uh, who here has attended a design review ever that got derailed by some meeting, meeting participant's personal preference? <laughs> and that of course happens, I've, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but it's still worth pointing out. You know, it happens because somebody says, somebody does the review like this. Uh, in the upper left hand corner we see the glide path chart and in the upper right hand corner has the volatility. The bottom we have two charts that are bar charts and that has the returns and the expenses. And then somebody says, oh, I, but I think the returns should be at the top because they're more important. And you have this whole discussion of pride and prejudice. <laughs> the better way probably to have this review is, well, let's use our scenario. So for instance, if the design review went like this, our most important scenario we all said was an advisor who wants to prove their own value to the plan sponsor. So they really need to look smart. If they use our tool, they would, could do something like this. Here, Mr. Sponsor, by the way, financially almost all Mr., I can safely say that, unfortunately. Uh, so you see the glide paths are all very similar. You can see that the volatility, they're all very similar. People might tell you that that's what you should look at. People might tell you that returns is what makes a big difference, but look, like there's not much differentiation. However, where there is differentiation is in expenses. And that's why I think we should look at expenses. And I'm proposing this fund that is, of course, the cheapest. And so now we have a discussion in the design review whether that our tool supports that use case. That's a much more strategic and much more meaningful discussion. But that would have been hard to do without our scenarios and without our audience model. Um, another artifact that was very much helped by this audience model is we did a kind of vision, like 
vision statement that you, many of you know from Agile, or in the game storming book they call it the elevator pitch. Ours is long, so this might be like some Singapore high rise that you need to pitch this in the elevator. But uh, so for the audience, who wants to go, 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 our tool does blah, blah, blah. And on the right is a competitive differentiation piece. But you see here, we're using the most crude tier, those of three audiences, and we actually only use two of them. So incredibly useful for our tool was also, it helps you eliminate an audience because you can put those big audience model next to it and get buy-in from everybody else. Like, see, we kick this one out, we kick this one out, we kick this one. Everybody comfortable with that? Whereas if you don't do it this formally, I feel like somebody will always feel like, did we really eliminate the right ones? Who exactly did we eliminate? And there's always this little uncertainty and this nagging and an impulse to, no, let's rather put more audiences in. And so I'll show one last artifact of applying this model, which is much deeper down into the design process. We got to some pretty detailed question on should that one feature be in or out so for instance uh, it says uh, in the in this column here how important that people actually let's take the one to the left there how important is it that people can save the parameters and that those discussions can go on forever depending on who you talk about but then this allowed us and you see in the left we use our audience model leftmost column here are just the three tiers and then here we use the middle tier of our seven segments and for each of these just could very much map there's now different components and different features here well how valuable is it to them so we have uh, very useful somewhat useful not useful at all so we scored these and you can do this through dot voting or through discussions and then with Excel we did this uh, automatic color coding where if it gets three points, it gets dark, if it gets zero, it's got white, and immediately you create this kind of heat map that tells you something about how useful that is and informs you, but also allows us to get buy-in. So when we show this to people and explaining to major stakeholders who were perhaps in love with the safe parameters feature because they've seen it with some competitor product, we could say, look, it's okay to leave that one out, right? Here's proof, and it makes everybody feel, you know, yeah, this was done in some kind of systematic way and not just based on um, somebody's hunch, which is of course something as designers we're always a little defensive about, right? Where people feel like, oh, you're just making that up, or you're just saying, no, 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 it's actually based on data. It's actually, you know, there's a rigor to this. Uh, so it's just a few more uses that I'm not going to show here. You, of course, an audience model like that, incredibly useful for onboarding. This was a long project, so team members came and left, and if somebody comes on, Showing them something like that to catch them up, very useful. We worked with vendors, showing that to them was useful. Uh, many of us do task modeling. Of course, you need your audiences, so it was very useful for that. Uh, of course, the designer uses it, so they can now use those scenarios to think through their design. And last but not least, for research. So we worked with Sax Insights, one of the sponsors here, in multiple iterations, it got tested. And you can tell them, uh, for this round of testing, we need two of these and three of these and three of these. And they can recruit because we know in our company who these people are and we have definitions for what an RP heavy is. The company knows what that means. Um, I don't know how that would have worked with personas. It's like we need three Kates and five Bobs and now you have to explain. Uh, so that can, be, that can be tricky. So I think in retrospect it was incredibly useful that we actually didn't go through the work of doing the personas. I mean, maybe it could have been also very useful. It, it certainly seemed to work out just fine without doing it. So the summary here, just to summarize a few takeaways, I think really crucial is this idea of having three different levels of focus so that we can just the degree of abstraction of audience depending on what we need it for. Um, I think in, avoid, in, in not fleshing those out, we avoided a lot of a company internal conflict. Also because some of these user groups are really small. Like, really important group here to the left, the, the client RM, there's five of those in the company. So if you now make a persona, that can become really awkward. <laughs> it's like this person goes, that's not me, or wow, you, you put James up there. Why didn't you put Jack up there? Um, prioritizing the audiences, of course, was very important here and guides product development and design process. 
I think another thing worth pointing out is just how we adapted the process as we went along, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but maybe not sometimes. I think especially in an agency, I always find that's harder to do, right? Because you promise them personas. Now you just say, oh, I don't want to make personas. Uh, right away, the client might think you're trying to you know, short them on your deliverables. Whereas that's a luxury that we have in a, when you work in client internal. We can actually kind of extend the project or shape deliverables much more flexibly and much more easily. And then I think the last thing to point out is just how the resulting audience model here, how completely different is from the marketing brief that you saw earlier on. Perhaps also working agency side, that's a little harder to just question what they gave you. But uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to question and make our own sense of audience models. And with that, I'll stop. And all oh, right, the hand already went up for a question. So do you want to step up to the mic, though? Or Weston, do you want to? Should, should we wait? Yeah. Just try it. Um, in terms of the IA, how did you tackle permissions for each of these user groups? Uh, you mean? Um, like in terms of for the data, I'm sure that. When we actually publish the tool, like how do they access it? Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Did you, did you stay with um, the implemented permissions or did you have to come up with a new structure for those permissions? You're talking about actually accessing the tool, like who, do, how do, who needs different access. And which, uh, and which data was available to the different users. Um, okay, so that really worked very nicely in our largest tier here because the tool itself, there's a lot of legal ramifications about the financial industry and the tool itself is actually, you have to legally file it with a government agency. It can only be used by financial professionals. So the employer actually is not allowed to see it. So that's exactly like you say. And we happen to have in our company, you know, of course our internal people have access these intermediaries here, they have login, so that tool is behind login. And these guys here automatically don't have a login, but they are the consumers of that output deck. And so then that output deck, in this case, it's actually less of a, how do we give them access? It's much more, how do we get them the legal blessing and get our legal department to, our legal department and the government to allow for us to give them access to it. So in that sense though, uh, I think our, it's a great example of how our, our model actually aligned very well in this three-tiered model with the needs for, uh, for online permissions and, and legal permissions. Thank you for that question. Other questions or thoughts? There's one in the back. Can, Mike, can you get a microphone to? Great book, great game storming, by the way. And yes. on that note, this information could be incredibly valuable um, to be used, especially in communicating, like you said, with stakeholders. Is this something that you have published, or did you pull some of this from an already published work? Is no, there a way to share this beyond the slides, which are hard to see from the back row? Oh, sure. <laughs> I mean, let's just talk after the session. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like, I think much of it follows that hoc personas model. And I think after that, no, I really just put it together for the first time for, for this presentation That's here. fantastic. So, thank you. Cool, if there's no more questions then. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna stick around for the rest of the day and I'd love your thoughts too or your questions or your answers. Thanks so much. Thank you, Hunter. Very nice. Um, thanks again for that. And uh, okay, I know we can smell the tacos, and like I'm getting really hungry and feeling a little weak right now. But but we have winners of raffles. Okay, um, and the, there's a lot, and we're we're trying to find a, you know a way to like make this. We we want to give our sponsors a little airtime, and we want to, um, but we don't want to spend a lot of time with people running up front to pick up things. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of read through listen for your name then go out where the registration tables were the prizes are there and like you'll find your card and your prize there 
Um, you know, some of these are sort of virtual things or things that we have to get sent to you. So we'll be keeping your card in that case, but if you want to double check that it's the right contact information, you can do that. Okay. So we had a couple um, power banks, you know, a little charger doohickeys from Saks Insights and uh, Ryan Bell and Aram Brazilian. So we got two winners there. We have Axur chopsticks, which are so cool. We have Anita Chang. <laughs> Please hold your applause to the end. Angie Carrier, this is going to take too long. Angie Carrier, Jeanette Shu, Beth Wegner, and Jennifer McCutcheon. We have an O'Reilly t shirt. I really wanted to just steal this one out of the box when I saw the thing. It's got like the polar bear coming around the side. It's awesome. Michael Aguilar, the O'Reilly t shirt. Um, we've got an Axure uh, license for Nathan Patterson. Yay. We have Axure prototyping boot camp for maybe collective for Manish Subarwal. Okay, we have several O'Reilly uh, journals, little notebooks for uh, Matt Rezio, Stephanie Washburn, Margot Deer, Grace Lau, and Jackie Newmark. And, okay, we have a um, couple books that came from the Understanding Group. Um, the Understanding Group is an information architecture agency. They also have some, some of the neat posters and bookmarks in back. So they sent copies of several books. Understanding Context for Tabitha Jones, um, How to Make Sense of Any Mess, Paul Lumsdane, and Intertwingled for Rebecca Kemp. All right. I think we're slightly more than halfway through. Uh, okay. That, this is really amazing, the, the uh, giveaways. We have um, the hard copies of Information Architecture for the World Wide Web, the fourth edition that just came out. Um, the O'Reilly, no, so these um, will be have, we have to send to folks afterward, but we, you can make sure we have the right contact information out back. So for Marcella Masirian, um, Alesha Arp, sorry if I can't read, read these here, uh, Mira Sutiono, Adam Bridge, Kip Holcomb, Christian Tumangren, Janice Kim, Dahlia Hedjob, J.D. Buckley, um, uh, Sue Candelier, Caroline Bautista, uh, Rodin Perez, Robert Lee, Julian Gautier, and Saruti Dulipala. Okay. And then we have a, um, a license for Just in Mind, the um, uh, online software service for Alex Karchiri. We have another Axure license for Kendrick Lim. Uh, we have one copy of the entire Rosenfeld Media Digital Library. Wow. Woo! For Brian Ness, awesome. And I don't want to give away two copies of something. Let me check this out here. I got to check this name. I think it's a dupe. It's a, um, okay. And we have a, a license for Mach Plus for Duke Bao. Okay, I think we're going to have maybe one more thing to announce later. And also, I think after, uh, maybe around, maybe a little later in the afternoon, we're going to have the, uh, the Amazon Echo raffle also. We'll have that later. All right, so for lunch, um, we're th we, have, we have Fandango, who was our platinum sponsor for lunch. We also have help from UX Radio and the Intersect Group to cover our lunch expenses. Um, and we, we have our food team. We have Kate and Kathy, and they'll help direct you. We got tacos set up out there. Um, there's the main set of tacos. They have the vegetarian tacos at the taco area, and there's a separate place for the vegan meals. I'm not sure quite what's where, but they'll direct you to it. So um, we have about an hour and a half. And so, you know, take some time to speak with our sponsors. Pick up some of the loot in back, please. You know, have a nice break. Thank you. <laughs>